Well, it may seem a little strange standing here in the middle of Tiananmen Square holding this iconic symbol of Canada, not to mention the fact that Beijing is going through a heat wave and lucky me, I'm wearing a suit. But this is no ordinary hockey stick. It represents the hopes and dreams of a little Canadian company called Asia Sport. And yes, it was made right here in China. The story of that hockey stick is like many of Canada's cultural and business connections to China. It begins here in Hong Kong, in, of all places, a shopping mall. Hockey has a low profile in Asia, so it's no surprise that finding the rink is a bit of a challenge. You have to go up and up, past the stores and bustling crowds of shoppers, to the very top floor. Then, just below the indoor roller coaster track, you suddenly find it's hockey night in Hong Kong. The rink is small, the ice is soft because of the summer heat, and the skill level, well, it's a little uneven. But the passion and the enthusiasm rival anything seen in a Canadian arena. Play street hockey back in Toronto and kind of missed it, so you know, found a bunch of guys out here who like to play hockey as well. And, and here we are, eighth floor of a shopping mall playing hockey. It's a very fast paced game and it's very exciting. So, uh, probably about half the players in the league are locals, and the, re the other half are Canadian, Chinese, or, or expat Caucasians. The man who helped introduce hockey to Hong Kong is Tom Barnes of a company called Asia Sports. If the South China Hockey League had a commissioner, Tom would be it. Asia Sports organized the league and stages tournaments across Asia. And tonight, he's especially pleased to see how the local kids are doing. At first, it was tough because it was so foreign to them. They've never really even seen it, not even on TV. So even though they, uh, they come out to the ice rinks and they skate around in the circles during public skating, uh, the ones that stuck around and, and watched the hockey game afterwards were, were quite intrigued. And slowly they wanted to uh, learn how to play, so we started teaching them lessons. We started giving them some of our equipment, used equipment, uh, until finally they uh, got their own set and participated in the league and, and joined our team. So, uh, yeah, the initial reaction was very cautious at first, which I think is part of the culture here. The league and Asia Sports, the company that runs it, got their start back in the early 90s. It began with a chance encounter with some Canadian expatriates who were a little homesick for hockey. I met these uh, Canadians that were playing hockey, uh, pick up hockey on Monday nights, and they asked me to help uh, organize their first tournament, first Hong Kong tournament in 1994. So I volunteered my time, helped out, tried to get some coverage on Star TV to promote the sport. Um, and then the following season, uh, again, we started playing pickup hockey on Monday nights. And so we had enough players. We had, got up to about 40 players. And we said, well, hey, let's start a league, you know, four teams of 10. We went out and got some Sultan sponsorship, got some jerseys. Uh, and then over the course of the next six months, I found myself spending more time working on the hockey than I was with my real job. So I talked to some of the uh, older Canadians here and said, let's start a company. I'll run it and uh, let's give this thing a go. So we, um, we went and sold shares to the players that were playing hockey at the time, uh, raised some capital and uh, away I went. If the game and the business of hockey are to flourish in China, Asia sports can't rely on a few expatriates. To succeed, it must entice Chinese, especially the younger generation onto the ice. That's why Asia sport is focusing much of its efforts on instruction. Most of these youngsters have never seen an NHL game and many of them have probably never even heard of Wayne Gretzky. But they do know which country produces the best players. <laughs> David Saunders would smile at that answer. His story is quintessentially Canadian, albeit with an unusual twist. Saunders grew up in a small town near Ottawa playing hockey. He eventually made it to the NHL and joined the Vancouver Canucks. After he hung up his skates, he picked up an MBA and found himself in Hong Kong. He's now the president of Asia Sports. A 
and that little rink in the shopping mall represents part of his hopes for hockey in China, and so does the company's newest product. This is an Asia sports stick um, that we have for um, the younger kids. The Hong Kong Connection, Canada and the New China, is supported by the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office and the Hong Kong Tourism Board. trendiest areas in Hong Kong. It's called Lang Kwai Fong, and this is the area to go to if you're looking for nightlife, entertainment. It's filled with bars, clubs, and restaurants, and not only is it a popular tourist spot, but a lot of locals and expats come here as well. Not too far away is Soho, called that because it's south of Hollywood Road. There's also NoHo, short for north of Hollywood Road. A popular area for bars and restaurants, you'll find some of the trendiest hangouts here. Hong Kong has more than just hip bars and restaurants. It's also on the cutting edge of fashion and style. There's no shortage of truly creative and unique items to be discovered. From mega malls and upscale boutiques to the lively and entertaining experience of a street market, you're guaranteed to find something that will remind you of your stay in Hong Kong. Think of a city that is progressive, free, stable, where opportunity abounds and quality is premium. A community that is innovative, cosmopolitan, enterprising, and well-connected. This is Hong Kong, Asia's world city. David Saunders is a long way from the family farm near Ottawa where he grew up. You might say he got here to Hong Kong on his skates. His hockey talents landed him scholarships and a brief but memorable stint in the NHL. That was fantastic. I was a 21-year-old kid just out of college and it's certainly every Canadian boy's dream and I was living. I just remember a permanent grin on my face and, uh, you know, standing beside Wayne Gretzky at face-offs and looking up and Montreal form and having 42 of my family and friends and relatives come in for that game. As his hockey career wound down, Saunders was thinking ahead. I got transferred um, with my job out to Hong Kong to set up a, a debt trading desk. Um, so from New York to Hong Kong on a two-year program. Thought that was it. We're going to be right back to New York because we're loving the city and um, loving life there. And eight years later, here we are. Uh, recently bought a place and no intention of, of leaving. <laughs> one of the things I love about Asia. Uh, it's great for entrepreneurs, and that, that's what happened. I mean, friends of friends, I, I knew what was going on, but hadn't played. Uh, my mom brought a bag of equipment on one of her annual trips a couple of years ago and lobbed up at the rink and met these guys, and I, I just saw it as a very interesting opportunity for me. At the time, it was just a league and tournament divisions, but um, now we're into some carbon fiber hockey sticks and building some ranks, and I, I think there's just a, it's a unique niche. I happen to know something about it, and. Um, you have that specialty or expertise and you can take advantage of it out here. Saunders hopes his new sticks will soon be appearing in Canadian rinks. He's hustling for orders and hopes that Canadian hockey parents will appreciate their quality and their price, 
but he also has his eye on the emerging Asian market. I mean, you're producing them here and trying to sell them there, and um, we're just really getting some traction on that. So the first few big orders coming in, and um, it's going to be an exciting part. Uh, these are three sticks that uh, right now are in our sample inventory. Uh, this is a kitty stick, which again, you can just see we can custom make anything for anybody. So this is an Asia Sports stick um, that we have for um, the younger kids. This is our mid-range, sort of a recreational stick. A lot of the guys at the rink last night were using this, and it's more than enough for you know those type of players in, the, in those leagues. And then we have our high end here, which as you can see, this is how they all come out. This standard black carbon fiber. Sports can best be described as a small company with big dreams. And that is exactly the kind of Canadian enterprise that the Hong Kong government is keen to encourage. The best way for people to get involved in work in China, particularly for the small and medium-sized enterprises, the best way for them to do is to come to Hong Kong, use Hong Kong as their platform. We also really appreciate the fact that for most SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises, they get one shot. If they miss that shot, they don't have another shot. For, for the big companies, they can go directly into the mainland and, and deal with the bureaucracy, deal with a different culture and so forth. But in Hong Kong, it's, everything is ready-made. You can come to Hong Kong and you feel comfortable. This is very much just like the way you operate in Canada. Even all the way down to the law that we have is based on a common law. So everything will be familiar to you. It's a safe bet that it'll be a long time before a team from China wins the Stanley Cup. But there's no doubt that when it comes to car buying, China will soon be the world champion. China's state-run news agency recently proclaimed that China has begun to enter the age of mass car consumption, proudly calling it a great and historic advance. Only a few years ago, the streets of Shanghai were teeming with bicycles. But as you can see now, cars have taken over. China is the world's third largest car market next to America and Japan. But the most important thing for Canadians is the potential. We see the Chinese market taking off. Um, it's been published in many, many different areas that by 2010, China should be the second largest producer of vehicles. In is China's first Formula One racetrack, and it's right here in Shanghai. It was built to attract the likes of Ferrari and McLaren, the superstars of the automotive racing industry. The track has also become something of a symbol of China's growing automotive might. It's shaped in the form of the Chinese character Shang, which means surging forward. It also happens to be a part of Shanghai's name, and it's a fitting name in more ways than one. Surrounding the racetrack, you'll find proof of China's surging car industry, including this brand new factory flying the Canadian flag. Only a year before, there was nothing but an empty field here. Now it's mass producing magnesium car parts. We supply to Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, uh, a lot of the tier ones in North America, Jaguar, Land Rover, BMW, Mercedes, Fiat, uh, in fact, uh, most of the uh, large OEMs and uh, tier ones in the automotive industry. Paul R. runs Meridian's Asian operations, and he divides his time between Shanghai and the company's global technology center in Strathroy, Ontario, which also serves as a showcase for its products. Most of this that you see is Canadian technology. Magnesium offers car makers several advantages. It's lighter than steel and stronger and lighter than aluminum. But it's difficult to work with and more expensive to produce. Unlike steel or aluminum, which can be bent into shape, magnesium parts must be molded and formed in these special machines. It's this technology that Meridian developed in Canada that it now uses to supply car manufacturers around the world. And for Paul R, that's clearly something to be proud of. This is a, a lift gate. It's cast in one piece, and this is an advanced uh, design. Um, it's in prototype and not in production at the moment. Um, this product down here in the center is um, a brand new product. It's the engine cradle that goes on the Z06 Corvette. 
um, recently launched, and uh, we expect that to be a large uh, producer for Meridian. Um, this is our patent pending X-Rib. This is the substructure um, underneath the uh, dashboard within a vehicle. Steering wheels, of course, are one of the um, biggest uses of magnesium um, uh, and parts on, uh, on a vehicle. Meridian's Shanghai factory is a joint venture with the Shanghai Automotive Industrial Corporation. And it was Meridian's advanced Canadian technology that made it an attractive partner for the Chinese company. Well, Meridian, as most foreign investors, brings technology. Um, we are the largest uh, producer of magnesium die castings in the world. We're probably the most technologically advanced outside of uh, some of the OEMs who have some internal casting. Um, as far as China, China brings access to the uh, local market, obviously. Um, brings a, a high level of skill within the uh, labor force um, and uh, obviously a great deal of labor uh, availability. China has a well-deserved reputation for low-cost labor, but that applies primarily to unskilled jobs. Skilled tradespeople, on the other hand, are in short supply and they're beginning to command better wages. Competition for skilled labor among growing industrial firms is producing headaches for companies like Meridian. Some of its best workers have been lured away by better offers and turnover is high. So Meridian finds itself spending more on labor than its original business plan estimated. These workers average about $8 an hour. That's a high wage in a country where the cost of living is still very low. And as in most marriages, there have been some bumpy spots. All right, of course, the language is the number one. Everybody knows that the Chinese and English, right? And the cultures are different too. And before we come here, cultures is a very, very big thing, even harder than the technology transfer. Technology is a science. Culture is something soft, really tough. You got to take you probably multi years to get that one migrant. So for me, it's a little bit easier since I was native Chinese, born and lived in China for quite a while, and immigrant to U.S. So got a uh, background of both uh, cultures. So I'm mean, somewhere in between, but they still need take a long time to convert the Chinese, the man side, to accommodate the Western countries' cultures. Despite those cultural differences, both partners are united in their optimism. The future in China is, is tremendous. Um, we've currently booked our plant to capacity. It's easy to see why the Meridian people are so upbeat. Right now, there are only seven or eight cars for every thousand people here. Compare that to an average of almost 600 cars for every thousand Canadians. Remember, though, that there are over a billion Chinese, and as more and more of them buy cars, the numbers and the opportunities can seem overwhelming. And where will all these new drivers in their new cars go for a spin? 20 years ago, China had precisely zero freeways, none. Now, thanks to a frenzy of construction, there are 35,000 kilometers of freeways crisscrossing the country. Only the U.S. has more, and by 2020, China plans to build another 35,000 kilometers. This headlong rush into a car-crazy culture has produced problems familiar to anyone in the Western world. The World Health Organization reports that China's cities are now being choked by some of the dirtiest air on the planet. The bold new skyscrapers in Shanghai, for example, are often nothing more than shadowy outlines. And of course, this pollution is taking a toll on human health. Still, the car has become an unstoppable force in China, and the economic impact will be felt around the world. Right now, there are no Chinese-built cars on Canadian streets, but that will change. Parts and pieces, however, are being shipped all over the world. That Ford, BMW, or Toyota you're driving probably already contains parts made in China, and the cars you see on the streets of Chinese cities likely contain a little bit of Canada. Well, historically, there's been a great interest in Canadian commodities that were going to be used for further stages of production. But increasingly, what you're finding is that the focus is on value-added goods, high technology, services, a whole range of other areas where Canadians have an expertise and where they can help to the development, help in the development of Chinese society and the Chinese economy. 
Canadian companies like Meridian are being welcomed in China, and not just because they bring in the latest technology. They're also seen as good corporate citizens, with much to teach about professional management, good safety practices in the workplace, and environmentally friendly production techniques. Yet the question remains, are Canadian companies taking advantage of Canada's special relationship with China? Other countries have given it more attention than Canada has up until now. Asia Sports is a young Canadian-run company with an eye on the opportunities China offers, and it's selling a very Canadian export. Meridian, on the other hand, is a well-established Canadian multinational with a proven product. Yet both have something in common. Both made their initial forays into China by beginning in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong government is hoping that many more will follow in their footsteps. Right now we have over 140 Canadian companies using Hong Kong as the regional headquarters, and there are hundreds more using that as, you know, as the, as the area office and so forth, and there are more coming. Uh, th those are the statistics that we could capture, uh, because as, as a fact that a lot of the Canadians, they also hold Hong Kong ID cards, so we, we, we couldn't capture a lot of the, uh, those figures, uh, but, but the, the number is significant, and, and I think the numbers could grow. The relative lack of Canadian companies here in Hong Kong and across China, despite all the advantages they would have, is also cause for concern in Canada. Other countries have given it more attention than Canada has up until now. We need to be much more focused than we've been up until now. We have uh, significant advantages in Canada. Chinese is the third most widely spoken language in Canada. And what we have is uh, a large number of people of Chinese ancestry who have family, friends, connections, who understand the culture, who speak the language. And it's an opportunity for us to take advantage of a, of a tremendously rich human resource we have in Canada, to take Canadian technology, Canadian services, Canadian goods, and to develop a much, uh, a much richer and more profitable relationship with China. There are signs that Canadians are now beginning to seize that opportunity. We're getting in slowly. Uh, I think we're far slower than we probably should have been, but we are starting to do it now. Uh, a lot of Canadian service industries are starting to move into the area. Uh, it's, it was, I think it was 1961, 1962, when Canada first sold wheat to China. It was our first big business deal with China. Uh, and now they're our third largest trading partner after the United States and Japan. I mean, it's an amazing change, and we're gradually starting to accommodate it. Uh, but uh, it, it's going to be the future, I think. David Saunders is betting on that future, and he hedged his bet by starting in Hong Kong, where he found much that was familiar and reassuring. Predominantly, business here that I've been involved in is, is done in English, so uh, it's, it's embarrassing when, when people ask me, like you did earlier. I, I don't speak Cantonese. I've been here almost eight years, and I can get around town or jump in a taxi or get to the airport for my flight this afternoon, but um, I don't speak it because so many people are either overseas educated or, you know, the education is very high here. Um, so predominantly it's business is done in English. And, um, you know, as far as the culture side, no, I mean, it's the culture of money. I mean, it's a good deal and uh, the factory wins and I win and the hockey player wins. So it ha hasn't been many very big hurdles. The flow of people back and forth across the Pacific have produced some shared economic goals, such as promoting the automotive industry and there are some common cultural touchstones that hold economic promise. After all, there are more than 250,000 Canadians living here in Hong Kong, and you can bet more than a few of them are hockey fans.